When Dermot Healy's last novel came out, around a dozen years ago, Roddy Doyle declared that Healy is Ireland's greatest writer. This was pretty good since his previous novel, A Goat Song, was described by Anne Enright, another Man Booker winner, as one of the big Irish novels. She says, it's a wrangle, an existential tussle, one of those books that makes its own language. Voice is one of the first things that strikes you with Dermot Healy, and it's especially true of his new novel, Long Time No See. His ear for dialogue, the way he inhabits his idiosyncratic characters, is remarkable. Just to complete the trio of praise, the novelist Patrick McCabe called Healy's memoir The Bend for Home, probably the finest memoir written in Ireland in the last 50 years. Dermot Healy was born in 1947 in the village of Finay in County Westmeath, where his father was a policeman. Then the family moved to Cavan, a market town near the border with Northern Ireland, where his mother and her sister ran a cafe and bakery. When he was 15, he took off for London, staying with his aunts and working in shops and bars. He went back to study at university in Dublin, but dropped out because, as he put it, I succumbed to a fit of shyness in the exams. He went back to London and worked in a variety of jobs, a world evoked in his last novel, Sudden Times. For many years now, Dermot Healy has lived in County Sligo on the west coast of Ireland. This is the setting for both his new novel and book of poetry, and it's an environment that he recreates with particular vividness and tenderness in both books. Unlike the intensity of Healy's last novel, the new one, Long Time No See, paints an affectionate, generous picture of a remote community. Dermot Healy is an affable, shaggy guy whom I met up with when he was in Toronto for the International Festival of Authors in the fall. I began by asking him to read from his latest book of poetry, A Fool's Errand. If you're on the headland and stop to look up, it's as if you were turning down the leaf of a book. So you might know where you stopped reading that evening the geese shot out into the dark. The book remains unopened for months, a whole summer. The story of what happened is left unfinished. Till one day you stand out there in the rocky V of the Alt. The quilt is shook. You look up in the library of coincidence and by chance find the leaf turned down at the sound of the mark. Dermot Healy reading from his latest book of poetry, A Fool's Errand. Geese, barnacle geese, provide the metaphorical framework for your latest collection. Their annual migration from their breeding ground in Greenland to your home on on, on the west coast of of Ireland. Can you tell me about the geese and and how they came to inspire you? Well, I bought a cottage out there about 25 years ago. And it would have been maybe during the summer, so they wouldn't be there. But they arrive in October, practically around the same date. And they fly in over the house five minutes after first light, and then they go back out five minutes uh, before dark, out to an island, Inishmore Island, and that's where they land when they come over from Greenland. And so they became a clock, eventually. They marked time, and then there was this thing about exactly six months away, then six months gone, and then six months back. And uh, all the formations that made in the sky, and local people had names for them. One old lady used to call them the writing in the sky. I did follow them out to the islands a couple of times. We did go out and try and photograph them. But I wouldn't be a bird watcher, but they became, they were nearly like they were watching me. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, it became an obsession. Because the, the nearby island where they, the geese spend the winter is, uh, Inish Moray is a, is a former Christian site. It's a bit, there's a bit of history that you associate at times with the geese, for example, likening them to nuns in shawls, walking the mission with white beads running through their wings. Yeah. Is is the island itself a, a special place for you? Well, I've gone out a good few times. I would have fished over the years uh, before I moved to the cottages. I would have fished out there. Oh, it's a special place, all right. It's actually, there's little bits and pieces from the past, but there has been some theft of various things. And uh, there was a Bertine stone. When, 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 what is when, that? When, when it's a, a stone with a shape like that, and women would sit. A, a birthing stone. Bertine stone, given birth. And to give you hope as you went along. And then there was a grave for the men and a grave for the women. There was a church for the men, a church for the women. And um, it became... This goes back to what, 6th sixth, sixth century or Yes, something? yes. And it also was one of the first places the Vikings attacked. So they knew about maybe the gold that was out there. But it has this extraordinary round wall with where you could sleep in it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's an extraordinary built from the original stone. 
and they've kept it up. But it has been a source of people have landed and stolen stuff. So now a lot of the really good objects had to be withdrawn. You weave a variety of images through this collection of poems ca- to capture the flight patterns, as you were saying. There's there's not only the idea of writing in the sky, there's the, the recurrent theme of sewing or embroidery. Mm-hmm. Because that was, the, again, the images, watching them, watching them, I began to get the feeling that they were like, actually, a quilt being shook in the sky. And then there was uh, the thing of one of them shooting up like a needle and the others pouring with it and then coming back down again. And there was a whole lot of images like that that uh, pursued me over the years. And then there's that thing of when they go out to sea, when they disappear, and they disappear quite fast. And it is like a sheet disappearing, like a garment. Folding, hopping, moving, and then gone. There, I mean, these images, you sometimes you call the geese formation, like very ancient hieroglyphic forms. Yeah, to be chased by that, because I think sometimes when you're putting words down on the page, I get a visual image of what that letter meant prior to it becoming an oral sound. And... Um, Sometimes that's what I get is the hieroglyphic side, that the image of sound as it walks off into the distance. And then sometimes they land in the field beside us. Another thing is, you see, if the wind is the wrong wind, they'll make it inland just about to the field next to us and they'll stay there for the day and wait on the wind to change, but it doesn't change, so then they go back out with it. But the sound is there all day. You'd be in the study and you'd hear this long conversations going on. And uh, sometimes looking out, it was like looking at language with the little head movements, a little bop. I suppose that's where the hieroglyphic thing came from. Not only are the geese associated with language and letters and and writing, but the poems are written as sonnets, formally exact stanzas that appear on the page like wings. And then the collection is also structured to reflect the migration of the geese, beginning with the sounds of their arrival and ending with the silence of their departure. This formality, is it all of a piece with the remarkable precision that you observe in the habits of geese? Well, I, I, I may be making it too precise, but it is a thing that you can know when they're going to go. They start up, the formation changes. The young at one stage are put in various places. Now the V becomes quite assured. And uh, where over Christmas, we say halfway through, the flight pattern will be very disturbed and uncertain. And sometimes you'll have what, what I used to love was there's always somebody that won't obey the law that flies off by themselves. <laughs> and there's a few like that, the stragglers coming in. And uh, then... All of a sudden, before April, the line becomes perfect. Like, not perfect, but you know what I mean. But the formation is now through to maybe a few leaders. And uh, they take off, and that's the end of it. When they arrive, it's a straggle. They're coming in from various groups of six, groups of maybe 20 will arrive, uncertainly. And bit by bit, the whole training starts. So you are watching a, a formation that makes itself precise over the six months. And uh, there was an old thing in Irish history where they talked about the wild geese when these were soldiers that went over and joined in the French and the Spanish armies. And they called them the wild geese because they thought they would return, but they never did return. And that goes back and to search for the geese was known as a fool's errand because they did think they were just living out at sea, nearby, someplace, and they would follow them and suddenly discover, no, the birds were gone. So that was the fool's errand where I picked it up when I was a kid. They used to say, don't be looking at the geese, that's a fool's errand. And, that's, and, and why did you choose it as your title? I just thought because I was looking after the geese, <laughs> following them, and I thought that was a fool's errand. I'd never make it, but I went on with it anyway. As you were saying, you could divide the year into, into birds. Yeah, the, the geese mark the sound of time flying. That's the title of one of the sections of the book. Could you read the poem that introduces that section? Okay. The sound of time flying. A tide stone is an angry dog. A moored yacht travels far in a fog. The last tune of the night was the geese in the bog. While they're away, I work on the beach. According to advice I got from a man whose name I can't remember. The clouds build. A lone musician sets up his keyboard on driftwood. The heron, like a single note, stands for hours at the edge of the mirror. The sea is not now in a rage. The drowned man has his hands folded over his chest. I lean over to throw stones in a cage. Dermot Healy reading from his poetry collection, A Fool's Errand. There is quite a lot of musical imagery. I mean, I think at one point it's referred to as the orchestra of memory. Memory, 
But that, that became, after a, few, a while, looking at them. And then when they were gone, the funny thing is you didn't find the loss. There was no sentiment involved, in other words. And another thing is that the swallows arrive nearly the same day that the others depart. So there's a nature correspondence going on. But um, there would be the orchestra of memory because when you try to remember the sound they made, you wouldn't be able to bring it back all that well. And if you watched them on TV or went to the internet, or something, no, no, it has to be the real bird. It has to be the real bird flying over. So the orchestra of memory is nearly where there's silence and then the odd little pit-pat. And then there's the visual thing of them moving around, making the sounds, just at that far distance of memory. And so I, be- I began to think of them, yes, they are the ones that come back. Now, if they didn't come back, memory would be in an awful way because memory's got used to the routine of they will arrive and that'll mark time and then they're gone, but you don't miss them. And if you start missing them, you're not doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> did you miss them? I mean, you had, did you have to learn that lesson? I had to learn that lesson, yeah, and stop talking about them when they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> Is that your wife saying that to you? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose so. But no, it was a certain thing that I just over... And a lot of neighbours, there was a few painters in the area, and they were saying, yeah, it's extraordinary how when they're gone, that's it. But you do begin to look around you when it's coming to the date of when they return. They came in a little bit later this year, maybe two or three days later. They land on the island and stayed maybe for a week feeding. I wouldn't think there's enough food on the island. And so they eat for the can for maybe a week, two weeks, and then they start coming in to the mainland. To the fields yeah, near there's you? Fields, there's four fields. There'd be about three and a half thousand birds. In that poem that you just read, it ends with, I lean over to throw stones in a cage. And that outdoor work is is mentioned in some of the poems. Can you explain what it, what it's about? Well, I'll tell you, the, we're living on the cliff's edge, an eroding cliff it was under severe stress. And I couldn't stand by and watch it happen. We lost the road maybe four or five times. And um, the strange thing is some of the big storms that come in travel right across from Florida it would have been one of the hurricanes, one of the, they could come flying in and the sea would come up and do a lot. So I had to do something. So the, the cages are gabions. They're wire cages. You put in stones, not in the form of a wall, half round, half square stones, and you place them round so it absorbs the impact of the sea. And it's like a, a fight on a Saturday night. If you go down when the sea is coming in at high tide, it's hitting this. And so I put in other stones and behind them and earth and all that and brought the cliff out. And so now we're experienced a p- bit of peace, but it took me two, two years, maybe three years doing it. We had a machine to bring some of the stone, but we had to collect the stone and fill them ourselves. They're, you would have seen them. They're used here on the side of roadways to mm-hmm. stop stuff the coming stuff down. Coming, yeah. And where they were first used, funny enough, is in France, uh, when they went out to the desert when they were fighting, they had no protection. So all of a sudden they made the, these wire cages and they were used by the Irish army. They were used by quite a few armies in various places. And the man Gabion was out there and he brought the idea back and sold it worldwide. So it became a defence thing in Australia. So the work, the work. Do you have to reinforce each year? No, no, no. You tie them up, they're rust free, which is the main thing because of the salt. They're a special type of wire. And uh, when you, you get them flat, you do to make the boxes and then the last for... I don't know how long. In, in one of the poems, you refer to the stones. These are different stones, but they're stones finding their place, sitting on their own weight at last. And I couldn't help making the connection to your work as a writer, letting the words find their place or working with language in, in, a, in a very concrete way. It is it. Well, I remember working with stone. That's the stone wall one. And uh, I m- remember people talking about that long ago, that the uh, hidden stone, the small stone who nobody sees is the one that's holding the whole thing together. And of course, that makes sense because sometimes you miss the little thing in writing that's actually the key. And sometimes the bad writing can be the key to the rest of them. And so you don't throw it out. And what looks bad and actually would turn out to be the little small hidden support and balance. So you're not hitting for decoration. It could be that little hidden one. And so I was building a stone wall there actually a few years ago and that's what led me to so, aha, and it's all to do with balance. And then no stone should be proud. That was another one. You'd hear all these things when you were young and they revisit you years later. And what does that mean, no stone should no, be proud? No stone should be sticking out. So you get that proud is sticking out your head, <laughs> sticking out. No stone should be proud, and um, there were all kinds of little small um, 
proverbs, I suppose, to do with building stone. And that's the dry stone wall, not cement. Right. But uh, the idea that it's it all has to find its own balance, but that it's the smallest one that is holds the key to it. I mean, that's... Is that true, or is it just? Oh, it's, it is a true. great. It's a great metaphor, but I mean, is oh no, no, because you see a square stone out in a stone wall, right? And you think it's balanced on the one below, but if you look in behind, there's a little little stone in behind it holding it up, and there's a little stone holding the one here, and then there might be if you in the old days what they used to use was quite a lot of shells, and the shell worked as a kind of um, it turned into a form of cement. You know what I mean? In yeah, you just sort of cr- scrunch up and... Yeah, yeah, scrunch up. and You'd find old shells. And one of the things I used in the book was when I was doing up the house, the old house would be a few hundred years old, went into the wall and what we find? Shafts of wheat, fresh as the day they were put in, <laughs> inside... In this was in, in your house, the house yeah, you bought? Yeah, the house I bought. When I were doing it up, I had to go into the old stone wall. And as a writer, what does it mean to, that the smallest stone might hold the key well that's what i meant by that little small thing that you think is of no importance can turn out to be the one that actually keeps the whole thing together and uh, when you look back on it it won't be the bad writing but at the time it appears like ah that's not (laughs) in the building of the wall and the idea of the of, of accumulating these stones there's also this idea of trying to get the curve right uh, in one of the poems, there's a line, the job is done, but something is missing from the curve that, that leads back upward toward the first unspoken Open word. Word. What's the curve? The curve, well, sometimes the wall can be straight, but sometimes you're going that way. In a in semi... A, sort of a, an arc. In a, sort of a an, arc. Bit of an arc, yeah. And uh, you could be doing that for maybe just to look at it, but it's, it's uh, the twine, when you're putting it up, they use twine for the walls. And if you're doing the... I think it's quite a dangerous one when you're doing the curve. Not dangerous, I mean, it's, it's just difficult to get it right because you might be going for straight lines. And then the metaphor, that was the, the first unspoken word, was all the time I'm aware that a writer may be writing down words, but the words were made up by others out there. And uh, going back to the unspoken word would be before the words were made, while they were forming in the head. And sometimes I get that feeling of when I'm talking to when I'm out there, that you can hear the silence that might have accompanied the first unspoken word before it was, when it was taken shape. And sometimes you get haunted by it. But that would have been coming from the geese thing of um, waiting and hearing the far off sound way out at sea coming in. When you first moved to Ballyconnell more than 20 years ago, you had no electricity. How did that heighten your response to... Actually, that was great because you went back to a different world, the oil lamp, candles, and I think we were five years without it. And what I'd do is go into town because I was running a, a magazine at the time. I'd go in and work and do my novel inside of the computer and come back out. But it was a whole different ball game, And uh, I sort of enjoyed it, never missed it. And when we got the, the electricity in, I missed the darkness <laughs> for a while, you know. Because in actual fact, there was a, an intimacy of reading underneath the lamp, the oil lamp. You do quite a lot. You wouldn't do half as much with electricity, even though it's brighter. There was a kind of turn in the pages. There was a kind of a little, uh, you were on a little voyage. And we got all kinds of tricks. We got more into the fire and the heating up the radiators, you know, in the old fashioned way. The house was warmer, (laughs) somehow or another. Could you read again from uh, A Fool's Errand? Okay. Overhead, a narrow head of stars. Follows after, a narrow head of geese. Boat shot from the one bow that is no more. The stars that appear forever hover there directing the flight of the geese to the island. Here is the tune. This is the path. This is the way, they say, and keep the faith as you cross the jealous wall built from the ruins of the invisible room. In the cold rain and the wind blowing inland, the geese lines break down into blots. They are no longer going to map out the beginning of life. To get home is uppermost. They stand in the air and the wind. How many wing beats is it back to the island? They fly in between one burst and the next. They cry like unkiled springs. The flap of their wings till the cold is lost. 
Dermot Healy reading from his book, A Fool's Errand. But the code isn't lost. I mean, the code is what guides them back. Yeah, it comes back. But the, for a minute, they have these awful sensations. They fly, they're going out, and then they turn. And uh, there can be all these breakdowns. This I was just saying midway through it, the code is lost. It has to be the right time of the year. It has to be a certain weather. And um, sometimes you have the magical formations, and other times you have this completely broken up. And uh, it's also when that rain is falling, you know, the rain coming in from the sea, they scatter, they go all kinds of different ways, and then all of a sudden they'll get that, and they're gone, they made it. But for a few, they do, sometimes they'd actually hover and be looking out. They would get up off the cliff and go up and come back down, trying to go. Dermot Healy, you've said that your writing springs out of a, a sense of place, the, the landscape, the people, the, the conversations you overhear, and you've lived in different parts of Ireland as well as London for a number of years. Can you walk me through a bit of your childhood in the village of Finney in, in the northwest county of Westmeath? What, what do you remember of Finney? I remember us going out on a boat. That was a very early memory. Um, I remember Mitchin from school and getting kicked in the head by an ass, <laughs> a donkey, yeah. In a field down from the school, it was worse than the master. Mitchin from Mitchin, school. I Mitchin, heard Mitchin, that means going off in the morning and not going into the school, that's hiding, <laughs> playing hooky, kind playing of playing hooky. Yeah, Mitchin, that's great. <laughs> that's the word they use, Mitchin. And then a donkey came up and kicked me. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's some moral, I know, <laughs> component to that. <laughs> uh, the other one is we used to go out on the lake fishing. My father was into fishing a lot. He was a policeman, guard, but we'd go out quite often. And I remember being out with them. I think there was three of us in the boat. And they'd caught whatever they'd caught. And we were just returning home. And I looked at the back and there was this pike following the boat. And the pike was one of the biggest fish I'd ever seen. I think I'd only be about three or four. And so I pointed out. And the pike follows all the way in. And then one of them shot him. And it was brought up to the village. And it was 44 pounds in weight. And they cut it in various parts and gave it out to the village. I always remember that. Uh, for some unknown reason, you know, well, not for some unknown reason, it just stuck in my mind. But that would be that. Then moving to um, Cavan, which is a town, Vinay would only be a small village. I missed Vinay and I couldn't get into Cavan at all. Why? Just wanted to be back in the village. And even though we were in a restaurant, a lovely restaurant, a lovely cafe, I was just, um, no, I wanted to go back to where I was. And uh, I remember one time a sister took me for a walk and said she'd bring me to Finney. We ran two or three miles and back in and there was Cavan all over again. <laughs> we didn't get near Finney, but uh, no, I did miss it. But Cavan, um, did you get used to it? I did, I did, yeah. And then I when you say part- the cafe, your mother and your aunt ran a yeah, cafe. Yeah, that's right. But then your father died when you were quite young. Yeah, so I wondered I, if, is that also part of why Cavan didn't... Well, he, when he retired to Cavan, like, he, he had been ill, but he still worked in the garden, etc., etc. But then he got more sick. So when I'd been going to, pri- to secondary school, when I'd be 13, 12, 13, 14, he'd have been in bed all the time. But I went away when I was quite young. I went to a summer. I went to London to an aunt. I went every year. And even went to the Isle of Man working. So some unknown reason, I was just getting out during the summer and eventually went to live in London when I was about 18. Yeah, you dropped out of uh, university in yeah. Dub- Dublin to, to work yeah. in London. and. You got all kinds of jobs there, security guard, builder, site labourer, carpenter, house painter. Did you like Insurance life? man. Insurance? Mm, I did insurance for a while too. <laughs> what, how, like so, selling? Uh, no, we're in the office, sitting in the office, doing all, all kinds of backward stuff. Fire insurance, life insurance. But um, security car was an interesting one, going along with a million pounds up a street and you and your underpants in the back of the van sitting on it. Now, why, because it was so warm. I was going to ask, why are you... <laughs> it was so warm, you had to take off your clothes, you were in the back of the security van. And you wouldn't see daylight until, you know, you could until be... Until you had a pick-up or a drop-off, you had to yeah. put your clothes and back so, on, I guess. Well, no, you don't get out of the van at all. You're locked in. You take the money in through a, a little hole here, you know, an apparatus. You don't get out at all. And it was strange sitting, looking out in Chelsea and you going travelling by. <laughs> and the other one was, a phenomenon was going out to... We used to go out to... Um, deliver gold bullion to a plane out at the airport, lift it in a little shed, and I'd have to take it and carry it up into the plane. It was quite heavy. Then we'd come back out that evening at five o'clock, go out to the plane and take it back. It had gone over to France. It was gold standard between the countries. You sent gold to each one, and that's the old days. So we do this five days a week, and I used to wonder, 
there's only one man in there where that gold sits. There doesn't seem to be anybody, you know what I mean, looking on. Counting, um, watching. Aye, and, and because you could come in that gate, the only man that was wa- wave is true. And later when I went back to Ireland, I read, lifted up, and the gold bullion had been robbed. <laughs> yeah. And there was, there was something out there that was going to happen. But I enjoyed being with a uh, security car. And I worked out at the airport quite a lot, looking after people that were in trouble that had come in from abroad. And um, I sort of liked it. Did you like living in London? Oh, yeah. I get sentimental for London. When I go back, I love doing the walk around the places, you know, that we used to stroll about years ago. And it was a second home. Why did you leave? Why did I leave? <laughs> to go back to Belfast, I think. Mm. I went to live in Donegal, then I went to Belfast. Northern Ireland, why? I think I thought it was I, I had a responsibility to do it. Do you know what I mean? To go back at the, in the middle of the troubles. Yeah, people. it would be a time people would not want to be living there. What, why, in what way? Well, it was just a series of coincidences. And uh, I went to Donegal first and then crossed over into Belfast and lived in Belfast for about a year. And I was working at the time on a goat song. Well, on, was, on your novel, Goat Song? No, yeah. Sorry, on the novel, Goat Song. And so uh, a lot of that period there would have helped me write it because I worked on it all the time I was there. When you say responsibility, I'm interested. What? what? Well, the thing was the Catholics knew nothing about Protestants. Protestants knew nothing about Catholics. The South knew nothing about the North. The North knew a little bit about the South. And it seemed like, how could you live with this, what would you call it, uh, ignorance? And I felt it was awful because I had, in the early days, would go up marching for the civil rights I honestly that was another part of the cabin thing we did the civil rights marches so it was always there in the back of my mind that someday I'll have to live here because I had lived in Fermanagh for a while uh, over the border so this wouldn't have been a new thing but um, one to Belfast was and I really enjoyed it although it was a little bit a little bit dangerous Dermot Healy in Toronto. He's my guest today on Writers and Company on CBC Radio 1, on Sirius Satellite Radio 159, and around the world on cbc.ca. I'm Eleanor Wachtel. Dermot Healy, the central character in your latest novel, Long Time No See, is a young man named Philip Feeney, but mostly he goes by the nickname Mr. Psyche. And the nickname's a bit ironic because he claims he has no interior life, although... He also claims not to remember his dreams, and we know that that's not true. Can you tell me a bit about this character and his world? He just settled in my head, and that was it. I went off with him, Mr. Psyche. I'd heard it used a couple of times as a, you know, a false name for young fellas. Oh, here comes Mr. Psyche. And for older people have used the term, which wasn't, wouldn't have been a word they would have used. But I've often heard them use words that they shouldn't be using, like Psyche was one of them. I don't think he's in a trauma. I just think he's on a... I'm finished with the school there and I'm not going to go to university straight off. I'm going to go work and I want to do this, that and the other. And also I think that he, he's helping out the family greatly by looking after Jojo. Jojo's his, 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 great, his great uncle, yeah. Yeah, his great uncle. He's just set on his own role and wants to do it. And I'd say the mother is a bit worried about him to a certain extent. But then she knows that he's the peace mover between both houses in the sense of Jojo will not take any advice and will not go to live with him even though he's getting older and so I suppose the dependent psyche is the in-between person because he's also an artist he, he draws people he and draws, animals yeah. and portraits from old photos and what do, what do you think he's trying to capture what's, what's he looking for in- I think that thing of when he's building the wall when he felt there was someone beside him building beside him when he, the man from where he's taken the stones from he believes another man built that wall which of course is true and now as he's building the wall, he thinks there's someone else there, a ghost of someone moving beside him. And I think he's accompanied by that all the time, that he thinks there's someone else there. And so the past, I think, is at his mind. He sees the past in the landscape. Although he doesn't admit it, he won't come out with it. But other people can see it in him. But I didn't want to overdo that. I just want him to remain a slight mystery, because he's a mystery to me. But he's also quite rational. I can go and do various things. And uh, one of the things I enjoyed doing was writing the piece where the father goes into the town on a Saturday night to look at people passing. Yeah, what, what's that about? They, they, they drive in, the mother, the father, and the son, and the mother and the son are sitting in the car for part of the time, mm. and the father is just walking around, and then later when they get out, they pass the father and they don't acknowledge. He doesn't recognize them. No, that's what, the what, law. What, what's happening there? That happens quite often. 
I used to see people doing that in Soho Square, standing for hours looking at people passing. Piccadilly Circus sitting down looking at people passing. In Cavan Town, there'd be people would stand with a fag in the mouth, stand in a doorway, and might stand for hours. There's a kind of thing then when country people that are isolated would come into town, they'd actually find a place and then look at people passing. And they might do it for a couple of hours. There was a couple of men I knew who did it. And I think that stayed in my mind. And then this is it. He goes in and he takes, the father takes great delight in it. But they're not supposed to come near him. No. No. Well, it's a sort of a ritual. What, what, what's that part of it about? I think it was a ritual that was already there because Jojo used to do it. His uncle. Well, the, the father's uncle. Yeah, the father's uncle. Yeah, the father's the father's uncle. uncle. Yeah. He used to do it beforehand. He'd go in with him. So it's probably a tradition after family going in. But you will see it. It's not uncommon. In Dublin and Grafton Street, you see people standing for hours. Well, not for hours, for maybe an hour watching people going up and down. Then they'll take off. And do you, do you know why Jojo won't go up to his nephew's house? Because he doesn't want, he wants to be independent, like quite a lot of older people do. They want to be independent. They don't want to end up in a home because his independence means he can cook for himself. He light the fire. Lighting the fire is a big thing for him. And um, yeah, no, he doesn't want to be looked after. And every time that the father tries to provoke us, or he gets angry. Jojo gets very angry. And I'd say that this, prior to the book where we enter, I'd say that it had, he'd been trying for quite a while to get him. And I'd say that that's why Psyche jumped into the thing and went down looking after him in his place. Could you read the opening of uh, oh, yeah. the, the passage that introduces Mr. Psyche and his voice and his viewpoint? And he's just arriving at his Uncle Jojo. First call. I headed down the townland of Ballantra in a force eight to light the fire towards the beginning of August. Ha ha, said Jojo, opening the door a fraction. She's windy, I said. Oh, it's you, he said. It is Uncle Jojo. He was my granduncle, but sometimes they call him just uncle and sometimes granda. Hold her, I have it. Right now, okay, okay, go, he shouted. I took the handle and slid through with a couple of newspapers under my arm. He stepped back as I stepped in. The tablecloth rose. Timmy the dog done a turn and I swung the door shut. Joe Joe studied me with his back against the shaken panels. I was expecting my dear neighbour, Mr Blackboard. I was sorry about that. And I said to myself, that's him. Aye, and it was me. It was you. But it was his knock. You see, a knock can carry anyone's signature on a day like that. I could have sworn. Do you know what it is, son? Memory is a stranger who comes to call less and less. Aye, and sometimes he's not welcome, if you know what I mean. Oh, he could be anyone, but not you. He turned the key, let down the latch, pulled back the curtain on the window and looked out. Is it the northwest? It is. The worst. But not as bad as February 9th, in 87, he said as he came back from the misty drenched window to the table. I don't like the look of it. The worst is at the filling in of the moon. He said, handing me the leather handle knife, and then he put a plate of unboiled bacon before me. You're just in time. I began to saw off some of the raw fat, and he threw the first slice to Timmy, who nursed it up against the bedroom door. Then Jojo brought the remainder of the bacon joint into the kitchen and set it into a pot of boiling water filled with parsley and chives. He put the small slices of fat onto a saucer on the middle shelf of the dresser, out of the reach of Timmy and alongside the picture of the wayward lad. They were for his rat trap that he would set last thing that night. Now, he said, how is the form, Mr. Psyche? Not so bad, Granda. Are you fit for dealing with a bad-tempered creature like me? I am. He stood back and looked at the dresser, then lifted down one of his prayer books and handed it over. Read, mister, he said, from the Psalms. The Bible he always called the Psalms. I picked the page at random, and as always it fell open at one of the texts where he had turned down the corner of the page from past readings. And behold, I said, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. He was not, he said. And after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, a small voice. Amen, 
he said quietly. We're in this together, Mr. Psyche. Dermot Healy reading from the opening of his new novel, Long Time No See. Young Mr. Psyche looks after his great-uncle Jojo with admirable care and, and tenderness. And, and Jojo is this uh, quite a striking character. He faces the loss of his best friend, his, his own inevitable death. He becomes both fierce and vulnerable. He's almost like a King Lear, you know, stripped naked on the heath. Have you known or had a relationship with anyone like him? Well, one of the things that when I moved into Sligo was the number of people that were living on their own in cottages out by the sea. Quite a lot of women, quite a lot of men. And um, I suppose their only place of gathering together would be the pub. But now the pub was beginning to close, not open until half six, seven o'clock in the evening. So another life dimension had gone. But no, they made an, an, quite an impression on me. They liked living alone. So a lot of the information that's in the book I got from purely moving into an area. There would have been older, older people that I've known, maybe way back in time in Cavan or something like that. But this thing of fighting for independence, I've seen it in quite a lot of people, you know, fighting to stay out in their own cottage, fighting to stay. And people knowing, look, I should, don't, don't, look, you should come, please, I'm not doing it. And uh, I come across that quite often. At one point, Jojo is uh, joking with a priest and he says, I've stopped telling lies to people I know, but there's a downside. I've begun telling them to myself. <laughs> what, what, what's that? And then he says, and that's worse. <laughs> what's that about? Maybe that he won't give in. Maybe, maybe that's shooting through the window. Maybe he has not. Maybe he's telling lies about what happened to himself to try and keep on. Maybe he's been, you see, one of the things about Jojo is, which is an extra, is that uh, he can't read. And therefore he remembers everything. But there's certain things now he can't remember and he's not owning up to it. And so he begins to tell lies to himself in forms of, you know what I mean, he's coming up against this. And that would be an awful uh, letdown to someone because they had extraordinary memories. I mean, I've known a few people who never written a word and have better memories than anybody I've seen. They can even remember the day you arrived, the day such and such came, what weather was like, what cattle were in the field. It's extraordinary. So that, to a certain extent, some of the dialogue in it is to do with that. This constant memory. How When he's asked about um, the girl he knew when he was young, Bridie, I don't want to think about her. She would be unhappy if she knew that I was being sad. <laughs> if you know what I mean, that sort of... Yeah. But that's, it's a kind of um, oral tradition. And I was trying to get that in. Jojo's close friend with another odd nickname is, is the old man known as the Blackbird. And the bird is something of a mystery to people, a man full of surprises. How do you see him? I saw him as a great companion for Jojo. But then when he died and there was no relations except one lad that came over, I think Psyche did not know that the man was so alone and uh, that my, perhaps Jojo was looking after him behind the scenes, you know what I mean, making sure he was okay, because he didn't go to the bars, he didn't go to, he went to get his pension, but he didn't seem to have any friends, and uh, he'd lived a long life like that, and I think it would have, Psyche only learnt that when they went to the church, and I think to a certain extent, Jojo only learnt it too as well, but there would be people like that cut off, and uh, they can find no relations. A couple of times, again, I have to say that this happened where someone died and no one knew where or what. It happened one time in London where a man uh, died and uh, I was living in Belfast at the time. When he died, there was one thing beside the bed was a copy of a book by me and they rang me up to see that I know who it was and I said, yeah, and all of a sudden I was able to contact the family, the whole lot around. He died in a room on his own and uh, they, he had never told them any contacts and by pure chance they rang so you know what I mean it can happen Was it a signed copy? It would have been and uh, they looked up my num number got it and uh, went to the publisher Yeah. and so I went over to the funeral for four or five days later to London and I suppose things like that stayed in my mind where someone dies there's no one and they're trying to get in contact with his relations so it's a kind of a thing when that happens it's a strange one why is he called Blackbird? He must have had black, black hair. It's a term used quite often. By this stage now, I'd say the hair has gone a bit grey, but he would have been Blackbird at the beginning. They use it for people with very strong black hair. 
a, a Spanish touch. Because there's quite a few Spanish things. And wears links. perfume. I like myself. <laughs> <laughs> there was quite a lot of men I I met that actually had perfume on the QT. And they'd be blasting themselves with it. <laughs> so they wouldn't have to wash. <laughs> There does seem to be an unflinching preoccupation with death in uh, in your novel, Long Time No See. I mean, the, the the old people express real sadness and regret about the coming of the dark. Um, as one of them says, life gets cold. But did you know when you began the story that death would be its subject? No, I did not know, no. And uh, at one stage, yes, the blackboard is down. I knew that. I knew he was down. I knew he was down. And then I could see, oh, oh. One time uh, I was playing a game of pool by myself in a pub in Ellen's and uh, drinking lemonade and the next thing in came a man and he said to me Dermot he says I've just gone by John's the light's not on and uh, he says he should be here okay I said wait wait a few minutes then somebody else came in and Tady again said to me look at the light's not on somebody okay so we jumped in the car went down and found his neighbour dead and the last line he said to me if he's gone I'm going too and that stayed in my mind and it happened like that. But it would have been, I remember things like that over the years where people would be so close. There wouldn't be that big of a gap in the death between them. I didn't know I was going to end up there, like writing about it, but uh, I knew it was coming someplace. Is there a blur of the border between sanity and madness? I mean, sometimes in the, in the novel, it seems a bit ambiguous. I wasn't aware of this. Somebody else said that to me. Are they off their heads? <laughs> 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 over here I didn't see it I didn't see it because I suppose some of the action in it looks like kind of crazy but uh, I think it's also play I yeah. think there's a kind of an underground play goes on all the time and sometimes then the tragedy does loom in sometimes they have to face into it yeah I think some of the things that come out of Jojo's mouth I mean he says he asks the priest if he's ever met the owl in the desert and the pelican in the wilderness <laughs> <laughs> and the priest was totally thrown because that's the readings that, and he was dependent. It's the readings from the Bible. Reading from the Bible. Yeah. And it's great. It, it, he got the Bible from the big house when he went to work on it. And The uh, big Protestant. Uh, big Protestant, yeah, big Protestant uh, house. Uh, and it's yeah. become his little Bible. It's become his night. And so that's another thing that Psyche does is read from it. It's kind of an interesting paradox that a young fellow should end up reading the Bible to a man who can't read or write, but has chosen this as, this is his main comic. And uh, obviously loves it. Well, you do have a gift for expressing a sense of heightened reality. I mean, there's there's an almost hallucinatory quality at times to the scenes you describe. And, and you said a lot of people are able to see better, see what's there, but you might see what you think is there. How does that work? I think what's what it is is the thing outside, just to the side, off to the side. Okay, out the front is the reality. Off there to the side is something that's you flick your eyelids towards, you flick your brain towards. And sometimes that to the side that's not important can sometimes be the key. But when you're looking at the mountain, the over here there can be something, you know, which actually gives the mountain its girt, gives the mountain its shape. And um, sometimes veering off from reality to see what's making it real is this on to the side. There's some sort of, I suppose we're back with the little stone that's hidden, that holds it, something of that nature. The new Ireland is, is also present in the novel. I mean, there's cell phones, there's other features of 21st century life. Uh, foreigners of all kinds wander through the story. I think uh, the barman says, the only people you meet in the pub these days are strangers. And... While some of the characters might lament the loss of the old ways, it's not, it's not a sentimental or elegiac book. But how do you see life in, in Ireland today? Well, the word recession would drive you mad because everyone says it and they're sitting up in front of a big drink. You know, the recession, I don't see it that way. There was a bit of a mistake, a big bit of a mistake with draw with buildings and stuff like that. So you're looking at empty estates. But in terms of losing the tradition, no, they're still there. Like, that's why I put in The Wake, because it'd be very odd sometimes that The Wake is disappearing. But no, they still have it. They still have the burial for the the locals dig the grave and then fill it in on the day of the burial. That would have disappeared in other parts of the country. So we're just talking to, to one particular area, and I just began to feel that 
I should acknowledge that some of it has persisted in certain areas, but it, it has gone a long time ago in others. And, and what about the recession? I mean, you wrote most of the novel when the economy was booming, and now it's bust. It's set technically, I mean, in 2006 when things were mm. better, but, but what's been the effect of, of the economic collapse? Well, I mean, you've got young fellas heading off to Australia, but it's, it's never had, it's never been the recession, so called. This particular period is not as hard as it was in the 60s and the 70s. It's not anything like that. And those people always going abroad. So I can't see it in that way. Cause it's I, like you going to London for work? Is yeah, it? the normal thing. It's because of the Eurozone and the whole history of it and how that took off into a bad circle. It went up high and went down. But I mean, you could foresee it in the sense of that there's too many buildings were being built. And that was the key to the disaster. And they're lying there out there like uh, witnesses, empty. And uh, it was foolish and it was greedy. But it was also a thing to do with how cheap building materials were. They hadn't gone up in price. So these houses were been built for next to nothing because if I had done up my own one and built it with another man, and I couldn't believe it that things were so cheap, I didn't know. I thought they'd gone up in price. So this was a kind of an undercurrency. And uh, unfortunately, that's the biggest letdown is these empty houses sitting, looking at you as a warning. Could you read another passage from Long Time No See? This is the scene where the community has gathered at Uncle Jojo's house for the stations. And Could you explain what that is? All right. The stations would be a community that starts bringing the mass from the chapel into the house and it would happen in different houses over the winter. It's still going on in that area. I don't know what has happened of late because the same priest that was there for years is gone from it. But it was where you had actually the mass said in the kitchen or maybe in one of the bedrooms and a few people, there might be 50 people, 40 people from around will come. And then there's food and then there's drink. It was a kind of like a little party, but it had the religious element to it. They possibly would say the rosary, but generally it would be the Mass. And um, there was a confession beforehand in maybe one of the side rooms. People moved along a line of chairs that had been placed next to the bedroom door. And as they stepped in to confess, talk in the room started up to cover the sound of confession. As the door opened, it stopped. Then when the next person entered, the talk was of animals and houses and timber. The Celtic tiger and building, then buildings, then silence. During the next confession, it was Volkswagens and rust and growth. And where is Declan? Then Balin. Then silence as a widow came out and a bachelor entered. And schooling. And what's his name? Married to Yvonne and Diane. And where is Declan? Those houses, the more houses going up in the village. Can it last? And so many bachelors and spinsters living by the sea, drinking and driving, and the fast cars and silence. And I looked at the Bradys who smiled back, and Mrs. Brady put a finger to her lips. Then the talk went to empty bars and huge salaries and the price of old slates and blocks and cement, and I prayed to myself. I prayed long and hard. Anna went in to tell her sins with a smile in my direction. Then a few more people arrived were greeted, and still Jojo looked beyond them, out there, past the candles for the enemy he was seeking. The bird stepped into the confession bedroom and pulled the door gently behind them. There was not a sound from within or in the kitchen. For once, as the confession was being made, the conversation stopped momentarily. It was like everyone was listening to find out what went on in his head. This local man that everyone saw and met and passed on the road or the beach, but no one really knew, because he was a loner who really spoke to no one, except Jojo. But all we heard was silence before the talking started all over. Then it was my turn. I was the last penitent. I went in and closed the door behind me. I went to my knees for an instant the priest. I blessed myself and whispered. He reached over and his hand came down on my shoulder. Is everything going all right tonight, he asked. I hope so, Father. How are they out there? Fine. Possession has ended. What did you say? 
Oh, excuse me, I made a mistake. I mean to say that confession is ended. I am the last. Everyone has been heard, Father. Except for myself, he said. Oh, now will you listen to me? I will. Things are not good with us, unfortunately. The church is adding to our lot, I'm sorry to say. I'm ashamed of what is going on out there in the world with the priests. Do you hear me? I do. It's difficult. I understand, Father. Good. Tell me this, are, are things all right with you? Not so bad. And the pelican in the wilderness. Pray tell me, how does that man Jojo come to know the Bible? I read him the Psalms sometimes. Indeed. Well, now, I'm glad you have someone to talk to. By the way, will you come up to cut the hedge soon? I will. Good man. He rose out of his seat. He gave a great wide gesture and made the shape of the cross in the air. And I blessed myself. And he turned and blew out the candle, leaving us in the dark. Dermot Healy, reading from his novel Long Time No See, is published by MacArthur and Company. It's great to have the chance to meet you again. And to see you again. And thanks a lot. Dermot Healy in Toronto. His novel Long Time No See is available from MacArthur and Company. His poetry, A Fool's Errand, is published by Gallery Books. 